now we go to Romans chapter 7. Now, this is the second exposition of a series of four. The subject is this way to godliness. In the series, we're working our way through chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Romans. Yesterday, we saw chapter 6. This tells us what we need to understand. It's something that we must understand before we can begin. So that's where we began. Today we come to chapter 7. And you'll see from the notice for the conference that I've called this sermon, This is a Cul-de-Sac. Now I think we all know what a cul-de-sac is. It's a no-through road. It's a dead end. I live in one. In a cul-de-sac you travel quite a bit and then you don't get anywhere. When you get to the end of Romans 7, you will have traveled quite a bit, but you actually won't be any nearer really understanding the way to godliness. But the Bible is very important in the way it teaches us, because it always teaches us the wrong way to go as well as the right way to go, and tells us avoid that and do that. So this morning, we're going to go through Romans 7, and we'll more or less end up where we started, but at last we will be in a position to understand Romans chapter 8. So I hope you'll come back tomorrow. I've also called it, this is a cul-de-sac, for another reason. A cul-de-sac looks promising. Uh, there are these big cars that go around our estate. They zoom down our cul-de-sac, which is about 20 meters long, and suddenly realize that that's the end. Fortunately, they have these wonderful brakes, and they can stop in time. It's only the big cars that seem to do that. Because these big cars, I'm sorry if you've got one, um, these big cars are always looking for a shortcut. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Our road looks quite promising. It doesn't look like it'll take you somewhere, but it doesn't. Now, there are lots of roads like that in life which look like they will take you to godliness. But they don't. But they don't, and you have to backtrack eventually. All over Wales, and well beyond Wales, of course, for example, there are Christians who are very attached to rules. Now these rules may be God's rules. Or they may be totally man-made or woman-made rules. But they're very attached to rules. And this is the way these people reason. And if I do this, and I do it well enough, and I do enough of it, and I do it long enough, if I do this at last, I will become a godly person. Now, when I say these words, lots of you will sing them in your head. Ready? Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day. If you want to grow. And the way we sang it in our church was, if you want to grow, if you want to grow like Jesus, Read your Bible, pray every day if you want to grow. Sounds really promising, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound promising? It's a cul-de-sac. That's why we need to study Romans chapter 7. When we've studied Romans chapter 7, it will clear away our confusion about rules. And as long as chapter 6 is in your mind, is it? then chapter 7 is safe, as long as you then do chapter 8, of course, which obliges you to come back tomorrow. So how shall I begin? Well, I'll begin, I think, like this. Um, I don't believe for a moment that everyone in the hall is a Christian. But I think I believe that most of you are. And there are three sorts of Christian in the hall. Some of you are the rules people I've just been talking about. So some of you are rules people. You've got a certain amount of rules in your head, and you believe that if you keep the rules, you'll be doing okay in the Christian life. And that also carries, of course, the conclusion that if you don't keep the rules, you won't be doing okay in the Christian life. When I was converted, I was given three rules. Worship, walk, witness. There they were. Worship meant to have a proper church life. Walk meant to have a proper quiet life on your own with God. Witness meant speak up for Jesus Christ to at least one person every day. 
They were the three rules I was given. Some of you are rules people. Some of you are no rules people. You know that you're not justified by keeping God's rules. And you know that you're not sanctified by keeping God's rules. So you've come to the point in your life where you don't have any place for any rules. In fact, you think that rules are a little bit of a nuisance. When I was first converted, I was hungry for the word of God. I found that it was often preached on Radio Monte Carlo 205 and Radio Luxembourg 208. Anybody ever do this? There were all sorts of gospel programs and pseudo-gospel programs and I don't know what we can call it, gooey, sentimental, candy floss, Christianized sort of programs. I didn't know which was which at that stage, but there was one which had a signature tune and I remember the words uh, because it was always sung, free from the law, O oh brother, believe it, free from the law, O oh sister, receive it. Well, there we are. They were no rules people. Now some of you are a bit w troubled now because you think, well, I'm not a rules person and I'm not a no rules person. So what are you? Well, I'm gonna call you no rules, but yes, rules. <laughs> people. Now your people, you know that you're not justified by keeping the rules and you know that you're not sanctified by keeping the rules and yet you love the rules. I hope like me, you've learned the Ten Commandments by heart. And you've done it because you love them. And you've often thought that one day you might be famous, famous enough to be on Desert Island Discs. And you thought, well, I'd be asked the question, maybe what sort of laws would I institute on a desert island if I had ever stranded there and had to organize some other people I happened to find there. And you, you think, well, I would I'd use the Ten Commandments. They would be our legal code. So you're sort of no rules, but yes, rules, people. Now, which of those categories do you fit in? Now, it's very important that you sort this out now. I'm sorry if I talk bluntly, but you don't have to invite me again. That's what I always feel, you see. <laughs> but it is important that you sort it out now because we're coming to Romans 7. And in Romans 7, there are three paragraphs. And although the whole of the chapter is for every Christian, there are certain paragraphs which are of particular importance to particular people. Now, let's look at it. Chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, is especially for rules people. Now here God's word is going to tell you this morning that rules do not rule us. We're not slaves of rules. We're not even slaves of God's rules. But we are slaves of Jesus Christ who died and rose again. We'll come back to that in a moment. Chapter 7 verses 7 to 13 is especially for no rules people. Now here, God's word is going to tell you not to have a low opinion of the law. Don't have a low opinion of God's rules. It's not the law that is the cause of your failures in the Christian life. It's our flesh. It's our sinful nature. The law, the rules, the law is holy and just and good. So ladies and gentlemen and young people, don't be blaming the rules of God for anything that is bad. The problem is inside us, not in the rules God has given. Chapter 7, verse 14 to the end is especially for the third category. You're the no rules, but yes, rules people and here God's word is going to tell you that there's a conflict going on inside you and there are a number of different words used to describe the the two sides of this conflict now in the last war sometimes the enemy were called the Nazis sometimes the enemy were called the Axis powers and sometimes the enemy was just called Hitler 
but we're always talking about the same thing. And in chapter 7, verse 14 to the end, one, sometimes one side of the conflict is called this, and sometimes that same side of the conflict is called by a, a different title. But there's a conflict going on inside you. And it's true that you got a new nature when you were converted. But you didn't lose the old one. What you lost was your former life. But you didn't lose the old nature that you inherited from Adam. Now, because of your new nature, you want to love and please God. But left to yourself, even as a Christian, you are helpless and simply can't live a godly life left to yourself. Obviously, some new power has got to work if you're going to be holy. And the purpose of the third paragraph is to prepare you for the glorious teaching of chapter 8, which is about the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian believer. So there's an overview of the chapter. Uh, when um, Principal Eveson read the chapter, did you, were you glad that you, you weren't reading it? In it's incredibly hard to read. What I will to do that I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. <sighs> Isn't it? Did you think the chapter was complicated and difficult? Did you say it's doing me head in? <laughs> Are you a little more at ease now? So let's take it verse by verse, but at a good speed. Let's look now at chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, which is a paragraph for rules, people. And I'm just going to spell out the names, the numbers of the verses, and, if you like, say what they say. Verse 1. Now, brothers, he says. Of course, when he says brothers, he also means sisters, because in the New Testament, all sisters are brothers. Brothers, he says, whether you're Jews or whether you're Romans, you, you know about laws. And you know that laws only apply to people who are living. I don't know how many times now I've sat in this hall and I've read those two notices. No smoking, dimmer smuggy. <laughs> Have you noticed them? Oh, good, great. Who are they for? Because there are people, you see, who used to be in the conference, and we thank God for them, but they're now safely in heaven, aren't they? They're dead. So who's that notice for? Have you gone down the Aberystwyth Hill from the very top? First of all, you come to a 40 sign, don't you? Then you go under a footbridge, and then a little later, you, you haven't noticed this bit, you come to a 30 sign. <laughs> then you get to the bottom, and if you turn left, you go towards St. Valon Vaur, and eventually you'll pass a cemetery on your right. So who are the rules for? The motorists driving down the hill, or the people in the cemetery? That's Paul's simple question. His, he loves pictures, doesn't he? Now let's look at verses 2 and 3. Now this is my sort of Oliot translation of the original Greek. Mrs. Atkins <laughs> marries for the second time and commits adultery. Mrs. Bevan marries for the second time and doesn't commit adultery. Why? Because Mrs. Bevan is a widow. While Mrs. Atkins, well, her husband lives in the next street. I want to stress, by the way, that Paul here is only using an illustration. He's not giving teaching on divorce and remarriage. That's just not in his head at all. What he's trying to show to us is that one person is bound to the marriage law and one person is, isn't. 
And what's made the difference is death. Laws don't apply to dead people. And death breaks the closest relationship which exists on earth. Verse 4. Just as death ends the closest relationship that exists on earth, so death has ended our relationship to the law. And I've written in the margin of my notes, wow. Now we learned yesterday that we died when our Lord Jesus Christ died. Everything. that the law demanded of you as a Christian was met when Jesus Christ died. We died with him. And as far as the law is concerned, we are dead. Christ's death has completely removed you from the sphere where rules apply. If you think I'm overstating this, then read Paul. But that doesn't mean that you're now in a limbo with no loyalty to anybody, no allegiance to anybody, no obedience to anybody. Our old marriage, verse 4, our old marriage to the rules is over, but we're not unmarried. And I love the picture could there be a more intimate living picture than this? We are now married to Christ. By the way, the one who gave the law. Verse 5. Let's think, says the Apostle Paul, for a moment about our life before conversion. In those days we had only one nature. That's why we were unconverted. But that nature was aroused and stirred up into life by rules, God's rules, good rules. When I was a boy, I, I was in the Cubs and the bus stop was about a mile from our home. They always seem to arrange it like that when you're young. And I'd walk down this long, long lane and on one side of it was an enormous wooden fence about eight feet tall with barbed wire on the top. And Every few hundred yards or so on this enormous fence was no trespassing. And as I walked down that road after cubs, everything inside me said, get over the fence. <laughs> That's what rules do if you've got an old nature. And therefore, your life bears a certain fruit, verse 5. And it's the fruit which will damn you. So, verse 6, let's be clear, says the Apostle Paul, what our present position is like as Christians. God's rules have no more rule over us. We are dead to them. Do you remember the slave of yesterday? We are discharged from the law. We are free from the law. But we're not free to sin but we are free to serve. Those are the very words he uses. Well, many times in Liverpool, people who've been listening to me preach have said they've had a headache. I hope it's not because of the way I'm preaching, but because of the material we're dealing with. Because it's hefty, this, and it? It's difficult. So the illustration I've always used at this point, it's getting a bit out of date now, is the illustration of a housekeeper and a wife. I say it's getting a bit out of date because a lot of young people sit there with open mouths because they haven't a clue what a housekeeper is. I'll tell you. If you're a single man and you're rich and lazy, <laughs> and there's no prospect of marriage, and you haven't got a whole uh, circus of young ladies who will do all these things for you, then you pay for a housekeeper. And as often as not, she lives in the house. And do you know what she does? Everything. Because you pay her. 
a man had a housekeeper. But she didn't seem to understand what to do, so up in the kitchen he put the rules. Meals must be at eight, one, and six. Washing up must be done immediately after the meal. Tea bags must be kept separate from the rest of the rubbish. Beds must be made twice a week. And all that was on the kitchen wall. And she did it. Well, these long, short stories are always, we always say they're a long story. Well, it's a long story, but eventually this fellow fell in love with this housekeeper. And he married her. And what do you think he did with the rules? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but she still produced the meals at eight, one, and six, didn't she? And she didn't mix up the tea bags. And she did the washing. Yes, she did the washing up. The only reference to washing up in the Bible is by a man, but we won't go into that. <laughs> and she changed the beds twice a week. Why? Because there were rules on the wall? She loved him. When you've got that illustration clear in your mind, I think things are beginning to come into order. Well, there's a paragraph for rules, people. And it wasn't so hard, was it? And frankly, no Christian anywhere should be a member of that first group. Paragraph number two starts in chapter 7, verse 7. And it goes through to the end of verse 13. This is a paragraph especially for no rules people. Now, you no rules people, I've met you. And you all love verse 5. When we were in the flesh, the passions of sins which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Now, you know rules, people. You love that verse. Um, Paul says that in our unconverted days, there were all sorts of sinful passions in our life, weren't there? Anger, jealousy, me first, sulking self-indulgence. Where did those sinful passions come from? Well, they came from the sinful nature. And where were they taking us? To death. And what stirred them up? Verse 5, the law. There you are. Say the no rules people. There you are. Told you. Rules spell nothing but trouble. Verse 7. What shall we say about that then? Is it true that the law, the rules of God, are responsible for our sinful behavior? Certainly not, says Jesus Christ through his apostle. Verse 7. It's not the law that's the problem. Don't blame God's rules for the fact that you sin. So let's be clear, says the apostle, let's be clear about the links that there are between the law and sin, and sin and the law. The end of verse 7 gives us the first link. The law reveals sin. I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So you think the house looks dirty one day and you clean it up. You spend a lot of time doing it. Out comes the hoover or the Dyson or whatever you use. Now comes the dust. Well, I don't know how you do it myself, but. <laughs> and eventually you finish, and you're hot and bothered and sweaty and tired, and you, you sit down in the front room and have a great big glass of Diet Coke, <laughs> and pick up a magazine, and at that moment the sun comes around and shines into the room that you've just cleaned. And what do you see, ladies? Exactly what the law does. Shows how dirty we are, even when we thought we weren't. 
That's one of the links between the law and the sin. There's another one in the beginning of verse 8. The law stirs up sin. Sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. Now, about a year ago, I was watching a TV program, and there was this very good lady who was a brilliant communicator with young children, and she was taking children five or six years old, one at a time, and talking to them in a room where there were all sorts of toys, and then she would say to one of the children, say to the child who was in at the moment, I'm sorry, I've just got to go out and get something I've forgotten, but while, I, while I'm out of the room, just sit there and don't look round. Well, the TV camera was in the room, and out goes the lady, and the child is sitting there. <laughs> That's why you've got to have the DVD and the video, because you don't get that bit on the, on the recording. <laughs> Because that's what the rules do, isn't it? They stir you up. And look now at the end of verse 8 and verse 9 and verse 10 and verse 11. The law condemns sin. Now Paul was once a boy. He was like all boys probably. Boys love three things. Food, fun and fighting. So do girls, I think. Especially boys. He was a boy who whistled and swam and was carefree. And then came the time when he had his bar mitzvah and he was a son of the law and was reminded now that he was responsible for his own law keeping and was solemnly charged in the presence of other people that he must now keep the law of God. And he was no longer under his parents' responsibility for keeping the law. He was to keep it himself. And he looked at that law which said, do me and you will live. And found he hadn't done it. And it didn't just show his sin and stir up his sin. He knew he was condemned. Ladies and gentlemen, the law is not sinful. The problem is our sinful nature. Verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. But that raises another question and the question is now in verse 13. Paul, are you saying this, Paul, that the law holds out one hand and offers me life, do this and you will live, and the law, with the other hand, holds a dagger and stabs me to death. Is it the law's fault, Paul, that I die? Certainly not. Look at verse 13, the whole of the verse. What you haven't seen, says the Apostle Paul, is how wicked sin is. That sinful nature which is inside of you takes hold of something which is holy and just and good and uses it to bring about evil. That's how wicked the sinful nature is. And if you're one of these no rules people, can you now see what Paul is doing? Yes, he's telling you that the law reveals sin and stirs up sin and condemns sin. But don't you say that the law is the cause of your sin. Here's a man who's designing a bomb. It's small, but he reckons it will kill everyone within 50 yards. And he takes it to a public place. And at that point, He's caught, arrested, tried, and imprisoned. In prison, of course, he's badly treated by everybody. You were going to murder our boys and girls, our neighbors and friends, whatever, wherever they came from, indiscriminately. You were going to commit murder. 
And he sits in his cell at the end of the day and he's in complete and utter misery. And he says, if it hadn't been for the law, I wouldn't be here. Is he right or wrong? He's right, isn't he? If it hadn't been for the law, he wouldn't be there, would he? But that's not the real reason he's there, is it? The real reason he's there is because of the wickedness of his heart. You know rules, people, and there are a few around. Don't you have a low opinion of God's rules? Stop despising God's rules. Our real problem is sin, indwelling sin. It's true the law can't save us. And it's true the law can't sanctify us. It's true. But it's because we can't keep the law. And the reason we can't keep the law is because of indwelling sin. So much for the paragraph, especially for no rules people. And no Christian anywhere should belong to that group. So we come to the end of the chapter. This is the bit most of you have been waiting for. Chapter 7, verse 14 to the end. This is a paragraph for no rules, but, yes, rules people. Honestly, this is the only group to which a Bible-loving Christian can belong. Now, endless controversy has surrounded this last paragraph. There are certain parts of the world which have been more fought over than any other parts. The place in Europe which has been more fought over than any other part is the little country of Belgium. There are certain parts of the Bible which have been fought over more than any other parts. And one of them, it's not the only one, but one of them is Romans 7, 14 to the end. I'd like you to notice that this paragraph is not like the previous one. Let's start there. In the previous paragraph, most verbs were in the past tense. In this paragraph, with one exception, which is a future, all the verbs are in the present tense. So there's a difference, isn't there? In the previous paragraph, I'm thinking particularly verse 11, Paul talks about an assault where sin beat him and knocked him down and assaulted him. But here he's not talking about an assault. He's talking about a conflict that goes on and 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 on. Now, ladies and gentlemen and young people, Know this, and know this, whoever else disagrees with it. Paul is talking here about his present experience as a mature Christian man. Look carefully at the paragraph with me. Look at verse 18. He says things there that only a Christian could say. Now, I've got good neighbours, and I think I know them quite well, but the neighbours on both sides are not Christians. I never expect my unconverted neighbour to say, verse 18, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Unconverted people don't just don't talk like that. I certainly don't expect my neighbour to say, verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am. Because if we start talking about anything remotely religious or spiritual, they're always telling me that they're not as bad as other people. I don't really actually expect an immature believer really to say those things very often. Uh, look again with me. He says things here about the law of God that unbelievers would never say. Look at verse 16, the end of the verse. I agree with the law that it's good. But most unconverted people I know think that most of the law is okay, but... It's a bit over the top, isn't it? 
Look at the beginning of verse 19. He talks about the good that he wants to do. Look especially at verse 22. Have you, ever heard, have you ever heard an unconverted person say anything like verse 22? Have you, honestly? Here's what it says. I delight in the Lord of God according to the inward man. In other words, deep down inside me, as deep as you can get, when I, when I see God's rules, I dance and I, I sing. I revel in it. It's music to me. It's symphony or whatever sort of music you like. It's wonderful! If you want to know what unconverted people think of God's law, you'll see it in chapter 8, verse 7, which we'll come to tomorrow. Look again. Look at verse 14. He believes that the law is spiritual, but that left to himself he isn't. Now, whatever your views may be, and if they disagree with what I'm saying, they're wrong, of course. <laughs> it is a fascinating paragraph, isn't it? I mean, he's just told us as an unbeliever he couldn't keep the law. But he's now going to tell us in this paragraph that even as a Christian, left to himself, he cannot keep the law. He's going to tell us in this paragraph that he sees that the law is good, that he delights in it, that he longs to keep it, and none of that was true when he was unconverted. He's going to tell us that his fallen nature is still with him, but just as it ruined him before he was converted, so his fallen nature still ruins him, unless the Holy Spirit does something wonderful, which is going to come to in chapter 8. He's going to tell us in this paragraph that he wants to be holy, but he'll never get there if he's left to himself. There's a, there's a note of self-despair here. He's going to tell us in this paragraph that the law can't take, make him holy. Because if he's ever going to be holy, something will have to be done about indwelling sin. Because that's where the problem is. But he's not going to quit the paragraph before he says, thanks, thanks to God, because there is deliverance in Jesus Christ. Well, we haven't a lot of time but we're going to go quickly, therefore, through verses 14 to 25. There are two things that we must do. First of all, I want you to notice that there are certain things that Paul says twice. Now, those of you who've got children, you say things twice, don't you? Look at me, you say, look at me! Why do you say it twice? And then you say, don't go out without putting the sun cream on. Do you hear? And then what do you do? Don't go out without putting the sun cream on. Why do you say it twice? Why does Paul say certain things twice? Verses 14, 15, 16, and 17 are almost repeated in verses 18, 19, and 20. Twice, he says, let's be blunt about ourselves. Verse 14. I'm carnal. I'm unspiritual. The old nature is still with me. It's inside me. It's attacking me. I'm no match for it. I'm its slave. I don't want to be, but I am. But he says exactly the same thing in verse 18. There's nothing good in this sinful nature that still lives inside me. That's something I know. It's a fact from which I can't escape. I've got an old nature and I can't shake it off. Twice he tells us that he's in a terrible conflict. Verse 15. I know what I want to be and I know what I am. And the two don't tie up. I've got to the point where I don't I just don't understand myself. Have you got to the point where you don't understand yourself? You're in good company. Then he says the same thing in verses 18 and 19. There's certain things I can will to do, but I can't carry them out. And there are certain things I can will not to do, but they're the very things I do. All sorts of things are going on in my life which I don't agree with. 
Now, on, honestly, 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 can you say this? All sorts of things are going on in my life which I don't agree with. Then you're in good company. Twice, he tells us, why he can't live as he wants to live. Look at verses 16 and 17. The real me, deep down inside me, agrees with God's law and wants to do it, and it doesn't because of indwelling sin. And then he says the same thing in verse 20. When I sin, it's not the real me. It's this wretched sin inside me. I've got this old nature. It's alien to me. It's foreign to me. It's rejected to me, but it's still there. Sorry about shouting. Can you see what Paul is doing? He's honestly telling us about his own experience. Why? To convince every Christian reading his book that all of us are in a mess from which we can't deliver ourselves. To bring us to the point where we realize we've got to have another power inside us. Now then, let's see how Paul closes the chapter. Verse 21. This is what I find then. I'm a person who wants to be good, I want to be godly, but evil is present with me and I can't shake it off. Verse 22. What's going on deep down inside me in my heart of hearts well, there I, I revel in the law of God. I delight in God's rules. I love them. Verse 23. Well, what's going on in my ears and eyes and hands and feet and mouth and thoughts? There's another principle. There's another law at work there. There's something going on in my actual living which is at war with what's going on in my heart of hearts. And I'm imprisoned in a situation where I actually live differently from the way I want to be. Verse 24. This is terrible, says God's apostle. This is agony. This is a wretched state to be in. Here I am with thoughts and eyes and ears and hands and feet that keep on sinning and doing what deserves death. Who will deliver me from that? Please listen to Paul's cry of despair in verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And please listen to Paul's cry of joyful gratitude in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now one of the most important things you're going to hear all the conference. The Christian life is not one of those cries or the other of those cries. Christian life is both those cries. It's both. It's both. It's both. We've had countless false teachers who've told us that if you're crying that, you can't cry that. And if you're crying that, you can't cry that. But Paul cries both immediately next to each other. Because that is true Christian experience. We are men and women and teenagers and boys and girls, and we have two spirits inside us. We have two natures, two principles. One of these is left over from our unconverted days. In those days, it was our only nature. It's not our only nature anymore, and it's not the dominant one. It, but it's there. It's alien to us. It's foreign to us. We're uncomfortable with it. We detest it. We long to be rid of it. And we're landed with it. And one of these is the deep, consistent, never silent desire to please God and to live in accordance with his law. 
So please see at the end of verse 25 how beautifully Paul sums everything up. I'm a man, he says, who serves. In my heart of hearts, deep, deep, deep down inside me, in the very roots of my soul, I serve the law of God. I do, I do. And in my day-to-day -day living, I serve the law of sin. I do. And now we're left asking the question. How can what's deep down inside me be the chief player? And not this wretched, alien, sinful, Adamic nature which I've inherited. And we can only understand that if we understand the work of the Holy Spirit. And God willing, we'll come back to that tomorrow in the glorious chapter 8, verses 1 to 17. Now, I don't know how you feel at the end of that, uh, at the end of that chapter. Uh, we haven't got any further, have we, really, in our quest for godliness? We've understood a lot of things. But I, surely if you've got anything in your heart at all, at least you've got some crying out, uh, crying out to the Lord for his help in this situation.